Hello students, here's lecture 2B, Significant Figures and Dimensional Analysis. Let's first discuss significant figures. Significant figures are all figures that can be shown precisely in a measurement, including one last digit that's uncertain or estimated. All right, and specifically, the error of the measurement you report in the lab will usually be plus or minus the last digit of the measurement, since the last digit, as we said, is estimated or uncertain. Also, the range your measurement is usually estimated from is the measurement plus or minus whatever the error is. So if your measurement's last digit is in the hundredths place, your error is plus or minus some number in the hundredths place. For example, in 5.01, the one in the hundredths place, the last digit, is the uncertain or estimated digit. Based on our rules, the error of the actual measurement here is plus or minus the digit in the hundredths place of one. So if the error of the measurement here were plus or minus 0.01, then uh, 5.01 grams will be estimated from a range of 5.01 plus or minus 0 0.01 or estimated between 5.00 and 5.02. Now, the trend for sig figs is the greater the number of sig figs you have, the more certain the measurement is. For example, in 5 grams versus 5.0 grams, 5.0 grams is more certain than 5 grams since it's got more sig figs. The way we can think about this is the error of 5 grams is plus or minus the last digit, which is the units place of 5. And 5.0 grams error is plus or minus the last digit, which is the tenths place of 5.0. If the error for 5 grams were for, were, for example, let's say plus or minus 1, then 5 would be estimated from or lying in a range between numbers like 4 and 6. On the other hand, if the error for 5.0 were plus or minus, let's say, 0.1, then 5.0 would be estimated from or lying in a range between numbers like 4.9 and 5.1. All right, 5.0, because it has more sig figs, leads to a measurement more easy to estimate um, because this range, 4.9 to 5.1, has only a 0.2 difference, while this range, 4 to 6, has a 2 difference. Obviously, uh, 5.0, because of more sig figs, has a range that is much easier to estimate from and reproduce in the lab if you want to perform the measurement in the same way again. Now let's discuss how to find the number of sig figs in any measurement. Looking at a map of the U.S., Note that the Pacific Ocean is on the west coast or left side of the U.S., while the Atlantic Ocean is on the east coast or right side of the U.S. Let's see how this helps us find the number of sig figs. First off, if a decimal point is P for present, then you have to read the number from the Pacific side or from left to right until you, you hit the first non-zero digit. Once you hit the first non-zero digit, from this point on, all digits will be considered significant. All right, so let's try two examples here of that. So in this first example, we have a decimal point. So we can read the number from the Pacific side until we hit the first non-zero digit. If we do that, we hit our first non-zero digit at 5. From 5 onward, all digits are considered significant. So if we count them, we see that we have a total of 6 sig figs. All right, same idea here. In the second example, we have a decimal point present. So we had to read the number from the Pacific side or left to right until we hit the first non-zero digit. We hit the first non-zero digit here at 6. So from this point on, all digits are considered significant. So if we count them, we see we have five sig figs. Now, if a decimal point is absent in a number, on the other hand, you have to read the number from the Atlantic side, meaning from right to left like this, until you hit the first non-zero digit. From that point on, all digits will be considered significant. All right, so let's try these with two examples. So in this third example, I have no decimal point, so it's absent. So I have to read the number from the Atlantic side or right to left until I hit the first non-zero digit. When I do that, the first non-zero digit I hit is 5. So from 5 onwards, counting backwards up until the end, all digits will be considered significant. So if I do that, I see I have four sig figs in this number. Same idea here in this fourth and final example. Uh, the decimal point is absent, so I read the number from the Atlantic side or right to left until I hit the first non-zero digit. When I do that, I hit the first non-zero digit at 5. So from 5 off... Five onward reading backwards up until the end, all digits are significant. So if I just do that, I see that I only have one sig fig or one significant figure in 500 grams. Next, let's discuss operations with significant figures. No matter what operation you use with significant fig figures, whether it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, make sure that you carry through every digit until you find your answer. Then at the end, reduce it to the correct number of sig figs. All right, so first let's add and subtract with sig figs. Here what you need to know is that the answer you get always ha must have the same number of digits after the decimal point as the measurement with the fewest digits after the decimal point, all right? So basically what that means is whichever starting measurement you had that has the fewest number of decimal places, um, that tells you how many decimal places you also need to have in your answer.
Okay, so let's try this out so this makes sense. For 6.351, we have three, um, three decimal places. For 2.45, we have two decimal places. Obviously, we first need to ask ourselves which measurement has the fewest digits after the decimal point, 2.45. So we circle this right here. That's, the, that's what we need to focus on. So since this has the fewest uh, digits after the decimal point, this number of decimal points is how many needs to be in your answer. So whatever our answer is, we need to round it down to 3.90, okay? And that's, again, because the measurement with the fewest digits after the decimal point tells us how many decimal places we must also have in our answer. Let's do this again here. We have this, these numbers, right? For 2.5, we have one decimal place. For 3.467, we have uh, three decimal places. We first need to ask ourselves which measurement has the fewest decimal places, 2.5, since it was only, a, only has one decimal place. So since this has one decimal place, we know this tells us also how many um, decimal places we must have in our answer. So when we add these up, we need to round it up to one decimal place. And we get 6.0 as our answer. Okay? Let's try another example here. Let me clean this up. We have addition, then subtraction. So let's do uh, addition, then subtraction. So we have 4.05, this, and this. Right here we have two decimal places, 0, 05. Here we have one decimal place, the point 0.1. And here we have two decimal places, 0. 0.81. We first need to ask ourselves, which measurement has the fewest decimal places? 2.1. Right? And the number of decimal places here, which is 1, also tells us how much we must have in our answer, which is just one decimal place. So when we add these two numbers and subtract from it, we need to round our number to one decimal place only. So we have 5.3 meters here for our answer. Okay. Next, let's do multiplication and division with sig figs. So the answer will always have the same number of sig figs as the measurement with the fewest number of sig figs. Basically, what that means is whichever starting measurement has the fewest number of sig figs, that is the number of sig figs that must go in your answer. So let's try this out. Here we have a total of, if we count, seven sig figs, right? And we multiply that by 2.01 millimeters, which if we count it, has only three sig figs. Obviously, which one of these two has less sig figs? The 2.01. And this number of sig figs, three, since it's the least number of sig figs, is the number that must go in our answer. So when we calculate this uh, volume in millimeters squared, we get 6.31 millimeters squared. Because let's remember, whichever measurement has the least number of sig figs tells us how many sig figs we must get in our answer. Since we have three as the least number, that's how many sig figs are in our answer. Let's do this here when we calculate density. 5.40 grams divided by this. So here we know we have three sig figs, and here we know that we have um, five sig figs, right? Which measurement has least sig figs? The 5.40. So this number of sig figs, 3, since it's the least number of sig figs, is the number of sig figs that also goes in our answer. So when we do that, we get 0.868 rounded grams per milliliter. Here we have these numbers added. Don't worry about it too much. Just focus on um, which number is the least number of sig figs. Here 14.3, we have 3 sig figs. Here we also have 3 sig figs. And in 15 milliliters, we only have 2 sig figs. Obviously, we have to focus on whichever number has the least number of sig figs. If we compare these, we see that 15 has the least number of sig figs, of two sig figs. Since two sig figs is the least number of sig figs in any of the starting quantities, that's how many sig figs must also be used in our answer. So when we calculate the density here, we round our answer to two fi sig figs of 1.1 grams per milliliter. All right, so there you go. So that's how to do operations with sig figs in a nutshell. For addition and subtraction, whichever quantity that you start with has the least number of decimal places, um, that will tell you how many decimal places go in your answer. All right. And for multiplication and division, whichever quantity has the fewest number of sig figs, that will tell you how many sig figs must also go in your answer. Now let's discuss dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is a tool used to convert between different units and solve problems. Generally in dimensional analysis, what you'll have is a given unit called a starting unit a conversion factor like this, which is a fraction where the numerator and denominator are equal quantities expressed in different units that actually are equivalent to one since they're the same thing, and a desired unit at the end, which is the unit you want. So let's try an example of some conversion factors. I know that 2.54 centimeters equals one inch, so I can set up two conversion factors, 2.54 centimeters over one inch or one inch over 2.54 centimeters. They, they're basically the same thing. 
I might as well also take this time to suggest that you look at the conversion factors to know in your notepad as to help you solve the next few problems. All right, so now let's discuss how to use conversion factors. Uh, you might know from math that units in the numerator and denominator cancel when they multiply one another. So when I have a given unit, what you have to do is I multiply um, by the conversion factor, which is desired unit divided by given unit. Doing this, add the given unit in the numerator here and in the denominator of the conversion factor, which leads to them canceling each other out. And all I'm left with is the desired unit here in the numerator as my answer, which is basically what I want. So basically what you need to do in dimensional analysis is set up conversion factors properly to cancel out unwanted units and to get a desired unit. All right, so let's discuss basically how to solve dimensional analysis problems. Step one, write the given quantity with the number in the unit. Step two, find the units you need to get to the desired unit, then cancel out unwanted units by using conversion factors in the correct arrangement. You can do that by asking yourself, should the undesired unit be in the numerator or the denominator of the conversion factor to cancel itself out? Then you keep doing that until you get to your desired unit. Let's try some examples out now. First, I have to convert 400 milliseconds into years. So I first write the given quantity 400 milliseconds. Then I see you have to change to years, which is a huge leap, so I convert in steps. I see I have uh, milliseconds in the original numerator, so I know I need to convert it to uh, years in the numerator eventually. Right? So first I know there are 1,000 milliseconds in one second, so I multiply 400 milliseconds in the numerator by the conversion factor 1 second over 1,000 milliseconds with 1,000 milliseconds as a denominator so that the units cancel out. The milliseconds in the original numerator here and the denominator of the conversion factor cancel one another out. And this leaves seconds in the numerator and gets me closer to the desired unit of years. Next, I know 60 seconds equals um, 1 minute. So I multiply by the conversion factor one minute over 60 seconds, where the seconds in the factor's denominator cancel seconds in the numerator here, leaving me with minutes in the numerator. Next, 60 minutes equals one hour, so multiply by the factor one hour over 60 minutes, where minutes in the denominator cancels minutes in the numerator here, um, leaving me with hours in the numerator here now. Next, 24 hours equals one day, so multiply by the factor one day over 24 hours, where hours in the denominator of the factor cancels hours in the numerator here, leaving me with uh, days in the numerator. Last 365 days equals one year, so multiply by the factor one year over 365 days, where days in the denominator of the new factor cancels out days in the numerator here, leaving me with the number of years. So how I do that is I multiply all the numbers on the top and divide it by the um, product of the numbers on the bottom, which gives me the number of years, which is 1.3 times 10 to the negative eighth years. Next, I need to convert 515 meters per second to miles per hour. All right, so first, I first write the given quantity, 515 meters per second. Then I see it to change to miles per hour, so I have to convert in steps. Let's first convert meters in the original numerator to miles in the numerator using conversion factors. I first off know that 100 centimeters equals 1 meter, so multiply by the factor 100 centimeters over 1 meter, where meters in the denominator of the conversion factor cancels meters in the original numerator here leaving centimeters as the unit in the numerator. Next, 2.54 centimeters equals one inch, so multiply by the factor one inch over 2.54 centimeters, where centimeters in the denominator, the conversion factor, cancels out centimeters in the numerator here, leaving me with inches in the numerator. All right, next I know one foot equals 12 inches, so multiply by the factor one foot over 12 inches, um, where inches in the denominator, the factor cancels out inches in the numerator here, leaving me with units of feet, right? Um, yeah, next I know 5,280 feet equals one mile, so I multiply by the factor one mile over 5,280 feet, where the uh, feet, where feet in the conversion factor's denominator cancels feet in the numerator here, leaving miles only. Now that I have miles, let's convert seconds to hours. Um, I have seconds in the original denominator, so I had to convert it to hours in the denominator. I know 60 seconds equals one minute, so I multiply by the conversion factor 60 seconds um, over one minute, where seconds in the conversion factor's numerator cancel seconds in the original denominator here, leaving minutes in the denominator. Next, 60 minutes equals one hour, so multiply by the conversion factor 60 minutes over one hour, where minutes in the conversion factor's numerator cancels uh, minutes in the denominator here, leaving hours in the denominator. Now that I have miles in the numerator and seconds in the denominator, sorry, hours in the denominator, um, I multiply the numbers in the numerator and the denominator, then I divide the product of the numerator and the product of the denominator by each other, which leaves me with 1,152 miles per hour after I convert everything, okay? 
let's try two more dimensional analysis problems. In this first example, we have 14 gallons that we have to convert to milliliters, right? So I first write the given quantity 14 gallons. Gallons are units in the original numerator, so I need to convert to milliliters. So first, there are 3.79 gallons in one liter, so multiply 14 gallons by the conversion factor 3.79 liters over one gallon, with one gallon as the denominator, so that the units cancel out. Because gallons is in the numerator here, and the denominator the factor, so they cancel out, leaving liters. Next, 1,000 milliliters equals one liter, so multiply by the factor 1,000 milliliters over one liter, where liter in the factor's denominator cancels out, liters in the numerator here, leaving milliliters in the numerator. Now that units in the mill, sorry, now that units in the numerator are in milliliters, you have to divide the product of the top numbers by the product of the bottom numbers, giving you 5 times 10 to the 4th milliliters, okay? And here's our last example. This problem looks difficult, but I'm going to simplify it. Note here that the units are cubed in both cases, feet cubed, decimeters cubed. The conversion factors you know are only one-dimensional, so all you have to do is, as you multiply um, by the conversion factors, cube each of the conversion factors. So basically, first take all the one-dimensional conversion factors you know and cube them as you multiply them to cancel units. So first I write the um, original given quantity, 424 feet cubed. Then I had to multiply that quantity, 424 cubed, in the, in the uh, numerator by 12 inches over 1 feet cubed to cancel feet cubed in the numerator like this, right? Leaving me with inches cubed. Then I have to multiply by 2.54 centimeters over 1 inch quantity cubed, leaving centimeters cubed in the numerator. Then I had to multiply by the factor 1 meter over 100 centimeters quantity cubed, leaving me with meters cubed in the numerator. Last, I had to multiply by the factor 10 decimeters over 1 meter quantity cubed, leaving decimeters cubed in the numerator. Now all I have to do is multiply 424 by the cube of every single conversion factor you just used. And when you do that, you get 1.2 times 10 to the 4 decimeters cubed as your answer. All right? So here all you did was, even though these are one-dimensional, you can just cube them to make them into three-dimensional um, units. Then you just cancel them out by, you know, whatever's in the numerator, put the same unit in the denominator to cancel it out and such. All right? Finally, please complete these homework questions, or rather these practice questions for tomorrow's class, which is also in your note packet. Enjoy your day. Bye-bye.